Brother Jason's sermon text is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Now I will have a prayer for Brother Jason. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you will give Brother Jason strength and wisdom to speak and that we would have ears to hear and that we would be encouraged by what he is going to give us. In your son's name I pray, amen. Well, there's nothing else scheduled until 5.30, so I guess I, I have plenty of time here this afternoon. I'm not sure who put me in this slot. This is a difficult slot because I know the flesh uh, is weary. It's hot in here right now for some reason. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hoping and praying and expecting the Lord will give me the necessary energy that I need to also energize all of you. I know you're, tr I know you're gonna try to, uh, to engage and uh, to put to death. I warned you about this at the beginning of this meeting. There's gonna be times when you have to uh, buffet your body and make it, uh, make it your slave. And this, this slot is, is probably that slot that uh, we'll, we'll need to do that the most, including me, because I'm, I'm weary as well. But uh, the Lord has been good to us thus far, and I, I pray and I hope and I have every reason to believe and expect that he'll be good to us uh, as we close out this afternoon session and then anticipate a, a, a wonderful ending tonight and the two speakers that I know all of you want to hear, Brother Al and Brother Given, uh, tonight. So I, I, I'm hoping that uh, the Lord will, will bless us this afternoon and give us that, that last burst of energy and strength into the, the final night of this year's renewal. Brother Bob preached on a text that was very similar to mine. Uh, he left me all of the difficult parts to talk about. But actually, I've, I've been very edified by the consideration of this passage. You know, there was a time in Israel's history when God said to them, because, because you have disobeyed me and broken my laws and broken my covenant, he said this to them through the prophets, both to Israel and to Judah. He said, because you've been unfaithful to me and you've worshipped other gods, he said, I'm going to take you out of the land that I gave you. And you're going to be carried away into captivity and exile beyond Babylon. And there was a period of time in their history where the people of God had to learn to live as exiles. An exile is someone who's not at home, who's living in a foreign land. And Israel found themselves taken out of that promised land that God had put them in, and they found that they had to adjust to life as exiles. They had to live in the midst of people who outnumbered them, who were more powerful than they, who were not like them, who had a different value system and a different worldview, had a different religion, who worshipped other gods. They didn't worship Yahweh, these Babylonians. And so Israel had to learn to live as exiles for a time until God graciously restored the people of Judah to the land. Now Peter, in 1 Peter, he addresses his writing to the elect exiles of the dispersion. And he's not just talking to those Jews, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to believers. Believers are exiles in the world. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger traveling through this world of woe. Everything Peter has to say in this text and in his letter is for exiles. If you're not at home in this world, this is a message for you. This is something for you that you need to hear for your own encouragement and edification. Some translations don't say exiles. Some translations of the Bible say strangers and aliens. Christians are exiles. Strangers, aliens, sojourners in this world. This world is not our home. 
Now, Peter wanted these believers, these exiles, to understand more fully what salvation's all about. He wanted them to understand what salvation meant for their lives in this world as exiles. Peter wanted them to see that their salvation was part of God's eternal purpose and is therefore something certain on which they could build their lives and their hope, again, as exiles in the world. There are some things that exiles need to know in order to have confidence and assurance. You need to know that no matter how the world treats you, God has saved you through his son Jesus Christ, and he has accepted you through faith in him. Now, my message is going to be very simple this afternoon. I'm going to focus on three words in this text, but they're three really big words. There are three key words that Peter uses in this passage. It's the word elect, the word foreknowledge, and then the word that is key, of course, for us at this year's renewal, the word sanctification. Now, these three words are all related to one another. They all fall under the larger heading of salvation. Election and foreknowledge and sanctification are all aspects of salvation. Now, the first two words, election, foreknowledge, these two words immediately raise us up to the lofty heights of God's eternal purpose. This is salvation from 30,000 feet. Election, foreknowledge, that's the mountaintop view of salvation. And frankly, it's such a high view that sometimes it makes our finite minds a little dizzy. We have, we have trouble sometimes understanding all of the implications of, of uh, election and foreknowledge because, we're, see, we're looking through everything from the, through, through the lens of time. And God doesn't have that limitation. God sees the end from the beginning, but we don't. But that's a view of salvation from the, from the standpoint of eternal purpose. But then in the very same verse, and only the Holy Spirit can, can do this, in the very same verse, we read about sanctification and that third word, and I'm, I'm going to spend more time on that than these first two because it's our theme, but this third word, sanctification, may be the most practical part of this text. And only God could do this, only the Spirit of God could do this, could take us from way up here on the mountaintop and then take us all the way down to where the proverbial rubber meets the road in your salvation. That's what sanctification is. That's where sanctification is where salvation becomes personal. It has to do with you and with me and how I live and how I think and what I do with my body every day. See, that's sanctification. That's practical. That's salvation being applied to me personally. All of that in one verse. So we start with election and foreknowledge. And I'm going to put these two things together under one heading and talk about them together because they are related. And then we'll talk also about sanctification. Both election and foreknowledge help to clarify that God is the source of salvation. Salvation is from God, by God. It did not originate with us. It did not originate with any man. Salvation was conceived in the eternal mind and purpose of God even before the foundation of the world. Salvation is going to glorify him primarily. It's going to make him known. Salvation is not just God responding to our needs as if we are the center of the universe. We are not the center of the universe. God is the central character and principal mover in salvation. We have to start there. That's our foundation. If you are saved, if you are in Christ today, it is of God, and all the credit has to go to him. Amen. So Peter is building our faith by taking us back to the source and foundation of everything, God. Amen. 
See, our faith and hope are in God. It is God who elects to save people. So let's talk about election. Election is not very difficult to understand. We do it every day. It simply means to make a choice, to choose. God made a choice. God made a choice to save those who believe the gospel of Christ. This choice was actually made by God before the foundation of the world. And Paul says exactly that in Ephesians 1 verse 4. Election is not you choosing God and God choosing you because you chose him. That is not election. Because Jesus said in John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. If it was God choosing you because you chose him, that's not God's choice at all. That would be your choice. But that's not what's being taught here. Now, election, election is not something that any serious Bible student should be unfamiliar with. It's literally all through the Bible. And this is, not, this is not Calvinism. This is Scripture. We shouldn't have any problem accepting this doctrine of Scripture. I'll just, there's lots of examples of, of election, but I'll point out what I think is two of the most important examples, and that has a direct bearing upon all of us as Christian people in Christ. God chose and called Abram in what was probably the most significant example of election in Scripture. Abram wasn't seeking God. Abram lived in a place called Ur of the Chaldees. It may have been in the same region where the Tower of Babel had been built. He, was a, a, he didn't know God. He was a worshiper of, of idols, of false gods, probably worshiped the sun, moon, and stars like the people that, at Babel may have done. And God called Abram. He chose Abram. Abram didn't choose God. That's election. Now God's choice of Abram anticipated God's covenant with Abraham's descendants, the people of Israel. And this is the second most, I believe, the most, second most significant example of election in the scriptures where God brought his people, Israel, out of, of slavery in Egypt. He brought them to the foot of Mount Sinai. He made a covenant with them. He chose them out of every other nation in the, in the world. That's election. A choice was made. A distinction was made. And here's what God said to them through Moses at Sinai. This is Exodus 19, 4 through 6. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. That's an, that's an image of salvation. Now, therefore, because I've saved you, therefore, you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant. You shall be my treasured possession. This is election language. You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So God's election of Israel was connected to his salvation of Israel from slavery in Egypt. He saved them because he had chosen them. Now Peter, in this epistle from which my text is taken, Peter uses this same language and he applies it to believers in Christ. Now listen to what Peter says. It sounds just like what I just read from Exodus. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, sounds just like what he said to Israel, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, that's election. Notice the connection there between election and the mercy of God. This is God being merciful. Election is God's mercy. In writing about election, Paul also made this same connection between election 
and the mercy of God. Romans 9, 16 says, So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. In other words, if you belong to God, who made the first move? It was God. Because it doesn't depend on human will or exertion. You don't belong to God because you went to God and said, God, let's make a deal. No, it was God who had mercy on you and on me. Now, I know this is a difficult doctrine for some Christian people, the doctrine of election. For some people, the idea that God would have favorites, they say, well, that's not fair. Doesn't God love everyone the same? If, you know, if God were to choose certain people over other people or even rejecting other people, God would not be fair. Well, my response to that is this. Do you really want God to only be fair with you? Is that what you really want? You just want God to be fair. Okay. That means everybody's condemned. Because God doesn't have to save anyone. God doesn't have to reveal himself to us at all. He's under no obligation. He owes us absolutely nothing except for condemnation. He does owe us that. Because he is a righteous and just and fair God. The fact that anyone is elected for salvation is not fair. It's grace. It's the election of grace. Election is an opportunity for God to be gracious because he owes us absolutely nothing. So salvation, see, is not a deal between you and God. That's what I'm trying to, to show you. The doctrine of election is developed so believers could praise God for his amazing grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Why? So that nobody can boast. Election, see, election pulls the rug out from under the feet of humanity and forces us down to our knees in humility before God. Amen. Election is really just an extension of the doctrine of grace. Without grace, no one would be saved at all. I don't remember who said this, but one of the brethren said, the gospel is like a door with a sign on it that reads, whosoever will may come. But when you enter that door, there's another sign on the inside of that door that says, elect. This is an insider's view of salvation. You see, there are aspects of the gospel that are unpacked for believers only. That's why we have these renewals, by the way. It's to unpack the gospel for believers. And there are some aspects of that gospel that are only unpacked for believers, and election is one of them. Election is not something you go and preach to the sinner on the street. We do preach the gospel to sinners on the street, but not this aspect of the gospel. This is, this is for insiders. This is for people who are already exiles in the world. So you need to know this that God's the one behind it. The inside view, by the way, is much bigger and better than the outside view of salvation. It's kind of like the old tabernacle. You know, all those rough skins on the outside of the tabernacle probably didn't look very good. It looked like an old tent, you know, but you go inside. It's, another, it's different in there. Believers need to hear the gospel. And that's why we're here. To unpack it, you know, some scientists say that the universe is still expanding and that we have not yet seen the end of it. As far as man can look through all of the telescopes, the Hubble telescope and any other telescope we might get and put in space, we try to look and we've never seen the end of the universe. And some scientists say that's because it's, it's still expanding at a rapid rate. Maybe God has made the universe as a kind of spiritual parallel to his kingdom and to salvation. It just keeps getting larger and larger and we haven't seen the end of it yet. I think I know why election is offensive to, to people. This doctrine is offensive to some people. To, to modern people, modern people like to think that they're in control of their own destinies. We believe in free will. But part of becoming a Christian is acknowledging that everything comes from God. 
And we depend on him, and we are not the center of the universe. God is the center. And for religious people, election's hard to swallow because a lot of religious people are on a work-for-pay program with God. But see, election's about grace, not work-for-pay. And so religious people get, I'm talking about Christian religious people, especially get offended at the idea of election because Religious people are like the elder brother in the parable of the prodigal son. Remember, the elder brother complained that his father was gracious. Religious people who are on a work-for-pay program with God are like the workers in the vineyard who had worked all day, and then they complained that they were paid the same as those who only worked for an hour. The election of grace can be hard to swallow if you're on a work-for-pay program with God. You remember what, remember what the, the master said to those, those complaining workers? He says, are, are you jealous because I'm generous? You got a problem with how I'm spending my money? Paul said it this way, who are you, oh man, to talk back to God? You got a problem with God electing people for salvation? You got a problem with that? Who are you? Well, more could be said about election. I want to move on to Foreknowledge. Now remember, election and foreknowledge are, are being taught to remind us of the source of our salvation. This came from God. Now, election is pretty easy to understand. It's a choice that's being made. Foreknowledge, I think, is a little bit harder for people to grasp because it's almost always misinterpreted. Foreknowledge is, is usually understood to mean that God knew what I was going to do and what I would choose before I actually did it. To know before. So when people read the Bible and they read foreknowledge, they say, well, this means that God knew. God knew what I was going to do before I did it. He knew what choices I was going to make before I made them. And that is certainly true. If there is a God, you would expect him to have that kind of foreknowledge. God certainly does know what we are going to do before we do it. But that's not the gospel. In fact, that's not even particularly comforting. God's foreknowledge here does not mean that God knew what we would do before we did it. It means that God knew what he was going to do. To be even more precise, foreknowledge means that God knew us before we knew him before we were even born, and even before the foundations of the world were made. It surely means more than that God knew about us, as if he simply had some information. Of course, God knows everything and and all people, but the kind of foreknowledge Peter is talking about is much better than God simply knowing about us. In Scripture, the word know is always used to refer to an intimate personal knowledge. It is a relational term. God knows about all things and he knows about all people, but God does not know everyone in the sense of an intimate personal relationship. I know this almost seems backwards. We usually talk about us needing to get to know God. But did you know it's actually much more important that God knows you? That's because God knowing us is God's recognition of us. It's God's acceptance of us. It means that God is pleased with us and that he loves us. So when we think about God's foreknowledge, we are really considering the kind intentions or plan that God had for us before we were born or before the world was even made. God determined that he would recognize and accept us into an intimate relationship with himself through Jesus Christ. And Paul talks about that foreknowledge also in Ephesians 1 verses 4 to 6 if you want to read that passage to get the same perspective. So while God knows all about all people, he certainly does not recognize or accept all people, but he does for those in Christ. God said to Israel through the prophet Amos in Amos 3 verse 2, 
you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Now surely God knows about all the other nations. He knows that they exist. But he had an intimate covenant relationship with the people of Israel. He knew them like a husband knows his wife. We know that before God had actually called Abraham and created the nation of Israel, he already knew he was going to do that. He had already planned that. God is operating according to an eternal purpose. He is not just reacting to human circumstances. God had already planned from before the foundation of the world to create a people who would belong to him. And by the way, the gospel tells us that this includes not only the descendants of Abraham, the physical descendants of Abraham, but all those Gentiles who believe in Christ. God was even planning on taking from the Gentiles a people for his name, Acts 15, 14. Formerly, the Gentiles were not known or recognized or accepted by God, but now they are. By the way, Peter also says in 1 Peter 1.20 that Christ was foreknown by God. Now, does that mean God knew about his son? Or that God knew what Jesus would choose to do before he actually did it? No, it means that Jesus was known intimately by the Father and was chosen for a specific purpose in the eternal purpose and plan of salvation. In much the same way, God knew you before the world began and he planned to make you his own through Jesus Christ. Foreknowledge is covenant language. It teaches us about what God desired for his people God wants an intimate knowledge or relationship with his people. It can be compared to a marriage, which is the closest human relationship. The husband and wife become one flesh, but those who are joined to the Lord become one spirit with him. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Marriage, Paul said, is really a metaphor of the intimacy between Christ and his bride, the church, this intimate union with the Lord is what God had planned for us in Christ from before the foundation of the world. That's foreknowledge. Before time began, God had determined to have a people, a people who worshiped him alone, who were intimately involved with him, and who loved him with all their hearts. And that is what the gospel produces because that is what God determined to do. That's election and foreknowledge. Again, the thing to take away from this before we move on is that God is the source, the origin, the foundation of our salvation. Now, God has a specific purpose for the people that he has elected and foreknown. And so now we're, we turn to this third word in our passage, the word sanctification, which is our theme this week. Again, election and foreknowledge clarify the source of salvation. Sanctification clarifies why God saved people and what he wants to do with them and through them now that they're saved. So we have a, a really a, a great overview of salvation in this passage. We have the origin, the source, the foundation of salvation. We have the purpose of salvation or why God saved us. To be sanctified. Now, in my opinion, it's sanctification that's usually skipped over by the church when the church talks about salvation these days. You can go to church and hear people talk about getting saved. And maybe even sometimes about going to heaven when you die. You can hear church people talk about that. But what it tends to be left out is that aspect of salvation that comes between conversion and heaven. And that's sanctification. That's the theme of our meeting this week. Why is it that God just doesn't immediately take us up to heaven as soon as we're saved, you know? Why does he leave us here? Well, he has a purpose for us. He has a purpose for us while we're still in the body and while we're still in the world. And he has sanctified us for that purpose. And we need to know what it is. Now, as we've already said... It's been said several times, those who are saved are sanctified or set apart 
for God's special use. That's the meaning of sanctification. Sanctification is closely related to holiness, which means to, to separate. The root word of holy actually means to cut, to separate. God himself is holy. In fact, did you know, and it might surprise a lot of people in, in the church today to know that it is holiness that is most often used in Scripture to describe the character and nature of God. Now, most people probably think it's love, but it isn't. That's an aspect of God's nature too, but if you study the whole Bible, whenever the Bible talks about who God is or what God is or his nature or character, it's holiness is the thing, the word that is most often attached to God's nature. That's because holiness is the summation of all of God's attributes. God's name is holy. God is separate, unique, different from everyone and everything else. This is why it's always wrong to represent God with a physical image. God's too holy for that. God cannot be represented by any created thing, especially something you create. When God took Israel for his people, he sanctified them, he set them apart, as we've already established, from every other nation on earth, and God demanded that Israel be holy. Why? Because I am holy. Now this is a crucial principle to see. The people of God had to be like God. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. That's the theme of the whole book of Leviticus. In fact, the entire law was a lesson in holiness and sanctification. God was teaching Israel about himself and what it would take for them to be his people. The ultimate goal was for God to dwell in their midst. And God's presence cannot dwell in the midst of an unholy people. To be in the presence of a holy God was a scary experience. Because it's God's nature to oppose anything or anyone that is not like him. And so no Israelite was casual about the presence of God. Great care had to be taken so that God would not curse the people when they sinned and offended him. And that happened on several occasions under the law. God's wrath was like a fire that would break out and consume the people. And so the law warned the people to stay back. Stay back. There's a separation between God and the people which was symbolized by that veil that covered the Holy of Holies where God's presence came down to rest. One of the recurring themes of the law was God putting up barriers of separation between himself and the people because they were not holy. Otherwise, God said, I don't want to have to kill you. Otherwise, my wrath will flare up and break out against the people. That's exactly what God said to them at the foot of Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. So if you want to meet with God and survive, you have to be holy. You have to be, you have to be like God. The problem is, is we're not holy in and of ourselves. We're not holy. We're not like God. And God's nature hasn't changed. So the, the gospel doesn't say... God's okay with sin now. God's okay with sin now. So he loves you just the way you are. You can come to him as you are. You hear all these things that are said. If that's true, then why are we talking about holiness? Why are we even talking about our need for sanctification? God hasn't changed his view of sin, his his. Because sin is anything that's not like God. God's nature hasn't changed. He's not somehow more tolerant of sin now. Something has to change, but it isn't going to be God. The people of God have to be made holy if they want to belong to God and be in his presence. And there are no exceptions to this. Even under the new covenant, 
under the old covenant, the people had to be holy. Guess what? You read the New Testament, what's it say? Same thing. Peter says the exact same thing. He actually quotes Leviticus. Be holy because I'm holy. The demand is the same. Why? Because God hasn't changed. What has changed? The people. The gospel, the good news, is that God has made provisions for us to be holy. And not just in a, not just in a ceremonial sense, but in a real sense. The gospel proclaims that you can be made holy, you can be made acceptable to God, and every believer in Christ is sanctified and made holy. Amen. Now, the Holy Spirit had something to do with that. Because Peter says, he adds in our text, sanctification by or through the Holy Spirit. The gospel promises the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what Peter said on the day of Pentecost, wasn't it? The gift of the Holy Spirit is promised, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is promised to every believer. So Peter is saying it's the, it's the Spirit that sanctifies us. Now God has cleansed us so that his Spirit can dwell in us. But what Peter is saying is that the continuing presence of the Spirit and work of the Spirit in our lives is what sanctifies us. He's not talking about the initial cleansing that enabled the Holy Spirit to come in. He's talking about the continuing presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. See, we're the temple now. God wanted to dwell with his people. He wants to dwell with his people now, except he's going to, do, he's going to dwell in the, through the Holy Spirit in your mortal body. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that fact, the fact that the Spirit is in you, that's what sanctifies you and sets you apart for God to use. You are a vessel. We've heard that said this week, right? You're a vessel. A vessel for what? For God. Amen. Himself. The Spirit of God Himself. Your body's a vessel for the Holy Spirit. You are a sanctified, set-apart vessel for God to live in you and to do something in and through you. You are a sanctified vessel for the service of God in the world. This gift of the Spirit, see, it's not just for your own personal edification. It's not just for show. The Spirit dwells in us because God wants to use us to do something. Now that He has cleansed you and made you a new creation in Christ, He has given you His Holy Spirit now you're ready for God to use you. That's sanctification by the Spirit. And by the way, that might sound bad to some people. I don't want to be used. You know, nobody, nobody wants to be used except for those people who love God. If we love God, we want, we want him to work in us. We want him to work through us. We want, we want to do his, his will. Now, if the Spirit of God is dwelling in you and if he has sanctified you, then you can be sure there will be some evidence of his presence in your life. I want to emphasize this the rest of, the rest of my message here, that God's sanctification of us and him putting his Holy Spirit in us means that he wants to use us to do something now in our bodies in the world. Yes. Amen. I'm not saying that what we've mentioned already about the fact that God is preparing us ultimately for glory is also a part of sanctification. I'm not negating that at all. What I am saying, though, is that the salvation is more than just getting saved and then sitting around while we wait to die and go to heaven or for the Lord to come. Sanctification doesn't mean, I think Brother Aaron already said this in his message earlier, it doesn't mean we just kind of sit on a shelf and look pretty for the Lord and not do anything. That's not what sanctification is. Recently, Ada and I bought a house, and uh, I, was, I remembered as we moved all of our boxes, and I remembered all of the little knickknacks and paddy wax that women need for homes, because we started to unpack them all, you know. And Ada had all these, well, I call them knickknacks and paddy wax, you know, they're just these little things that women love that sit around the house and I don't know what they do they just kind of sit there and I noticed there was this one piece she had it was this tall metal vase and it had all of these twisty sticky things coming out of it and she wrapped some lights around it and she put it in the corner and plugged it in and it sits there and blinks off 
and on and off and on. What does that do? What is that for? It's, it's not for anything. It just, it's just to sit there. Now, is that what sanctification is? Did God just sit you in a corner just to sit there and blink? Just to sit there and look pretty without any usefulness at all? I'll tell you what sanctification is, is like. You know, we have sanctified people in the world even. Soldiers are sanctified. Do soldiers just sit around and look pretty? No, they are, they are useful to do some work. And sometimes it's, it's bad work too. Hard work. Police officers are sanctified people. Do they just sit around and look pretty? No, they're set aside to do some work. Nurses and doctors are sanctified people. They don't just sit around. They, they do some work, important work. Firefighters are sanctified men. They don't just sit around. They're not supposed to. They're sanctified to do a work. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see what I'm illustrating? Sanctification is for a work. Now remember that Peter is writing to people who are exiles in the world. This is one of the effects of the Spirit dwelling in us. The very presence of the Spirit in us makes us exiles in the world. We simply don't fit in with the world because we're being driven by a different power. Ephesians 2 verse 2 says the Spirit is at work, the, 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 uh, Satan is the Spirit at work in the disobedient. The Holy Spirit's at work in the believer. That makes us at variance with the spirit of the age. The world has a spirit at work in it. We have a spirit at work in us. There's variance. When we feel this conflict with the world, we should rejoice because it's evidence that we are God's people. Now, we addressed this in our discussion, but I want to address it myself. What is the world? The world is more than what we call culture or society. The world has a certain spiritual quality. It is an organized system of rebellion against God that is animated by Satan, who is the ruler of this world and is called the God of this world. The world has certain values and goals, all of which are opposed to God. You can read 1 John 2, 15-17. I say this because I think Christians get confused about what the world really is and how we should be separate from it. Now, if the world is nothing more than culture, all we have to do to be separate from it is to just be weird. If culture zigs, then we zag. We buck the trends, and voila, we're automatically sanctified, right? We're different. I don't think it's that simple. Or some Christians say, well, there's some period of time in the past that was more holy than the present. So we're going to go back there and pretend like it's the 1950s. Or even better, that it's the 19th century. And we're going to live like they did back then. And then we're sanctified, right? I think that is superficial. I think that is shallow. I don't think that's true sanctification at all. Because true sanctification has to go into our desires and our affections, and our thoughts, and our goals, and our values. And if it doesn't get in there, it's nothing but legalism. Amen. Or nostalgia. Or something cultural. And that's why almost every, if you study this, study church history, almost every holiness movement that has ever happened in the church has always ended up in legalism. Another way the church gets this wrong is to define holiness as, or sanctification as physical distance. So we're going to lock ourselves in a closet and call ourselves sanctified. We're going to buy some property in the mountains and build a fence and live together and be separate and sanctified. That's what the church did in the first few centuries. There were men that moved out into the desert. There was a monk, you know, that lived for several years on top of a pole and every year he'd build his pole a little bit higher. Is that sanctification? He was separate. No, it's not physical distance. If we're physically distant from the rest of the world, we will not be able to be used by God in the world. Jesus said his disciples are like salt, and salt must be applied and be present in order to work. 
You'll notice, by the way, that sanctification is almost always defined negatively as to what we must avoid. But the goal of sanctification is not to just get away from the world. The goal is to get close to God and be used by Him in the world. Now, having said all that, please don't misunderstand me. Having said all that, sanctification does mean being separate from sin. A person who is not separate from sin has no reason to even believe that he or she is saved. How can we be saved from sin if it still dominates our lives? We know we are the children of God if we are led by his spirit to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Romans 8, 12 to 14. So do you want assurance that you are saved and that you're a child of God? Are you putting to death the deeds of the flesh by the spirit? Are you ruling over your body and using it to serve God instead of serving sin? If you're doing that, then you're being led by the spirit and you're a child of God who has been sanctified. But just remember, the whole point of putting sin to death is so that we can live for God. Sin is no longer our master, and we are now using our physical bodies to serve the Lord. So we have the Spirit living in us. That makes us different. But the Holy Spirit wants to do something in us while we are in the world. The Holy Spirit wants to make us instruments and vessels for the Lord to use. And so the Spirit actually dwells in our bodies because God wants to use our mortal bodies in this world. Your body, by the way, is how you interface with the world. If you didn't have a body, if you were just a spirit, you couldn't interface with the world. Amen. Our bodies belong to the Lord. He purchased our bodies. When Christ died, and then he sent his spirit to dwell in our bodies, giving life to what was once dead in trespasses and sins. So the believer has no right to live for himself in the world. We've been set free from serving sin so that we can serve God. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 4, verses 2 and 3. He says, you've spent enough time in the world gratifying your own desires. It's time to serve God with your body. That's sanctification. Being saved and sanctified means we now belong to the Lord and we offer our bodies to him as living sacrifices. There's more to being saved than just going to heaven when we die. There is something for us to do now in these mortal coils. The first thing we have to do, and I'm coming back to the, to the, the first thing I talked about, we live as exiles. We live as strangers and aliens in the world. That means living a different kind of life. One that's in harmony with our true homeland. Being willing also, and this has been brought out, to endure suffering. Exiles suffer while we're in this world. Instead of adapting to the world, we live as exiles, maintaining our distinction from the world around us, even when the people of this world hate us and reject us and persecute us. Suffering is a part of our sanctification. Remember, you're being set apart for God in a world that hates God. Now, how do you think that's going to work out? It's going to work out in some opposition, some conflict. Now, as we interface with the world, as we're being used by God in this world, Peter says, and every, everything I'm going to say, I'm almost done, everything I'm going to say now just comes out of the larger context of, of Peter's epistle as it unfolds. Peter says, we're not supposed to interface with the world with hostility, like we hate everyone in the world. He says we're to do this with gentleness and respect. Why? So that the people of this world will listen to our witness for Christ and the hope that we have in him. He says be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you for the hope that lies within you. 1 Peter 3.15, he says, but do this with gentleness and respect. We're not to live, secondly, he says, Peter says, we're not to live in the world as rebels or troublemakers. We're to submit to all the earthly authorities. Chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. We're to be aware that the world is watching how we live. So we're always to do what is right and what is good, even if we suffer as a result. And in so doing, we will be living according to the example of Jesus himself, who did what was right, and selflessly and silently bore unjust suffering from evil men. As we live in this world as exiles, we have to entrust ourselves to God and to his care 
even as we suffer the world's rejection. I want to emphasize this again. I don't think this can be emphasized too much, that sanctification is not just the negative aspect of refraining from sin. There's a positive aspect here. The people of God should not just be known for what we don't do. We should be known for what we do. Saints should be known for doing what is good. We should be known for good works. That's why we were saved. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, by grace you've been saved. You know the rest of that passage? For we're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That sounds like foreknowledge. We should let our light shine, doing good works so that other people can see that we are serving the Lord. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16. We're not to do our good works to be praised by men, but so that men might praise the God we are serving. And that's the difference between good works done by the saints and good works done by the people of the world. The people of the world don't do their good works for the glory of God, but the saints do. The objective, Peter says, is to live such good lives in the midst of an evil world that even the pagans have nothing bad to say about us. That's quite a goal. That's sanctification. And that's the major theme of Peter's epistle. You're in exile living in the midst of all these pagans. Peter says, live such good lives among the pagans that they, they don't have anything bad to say about how you live. We should live such exceptional lives that unbelievers notice the difference and ask us why we live like we do. Then we have an opportunity Amen. to be a witness for Christ. Our lifestyle should complement and not contradict the gospel. That's sanctification. We adorn the doctrine with our lives, Titus 2 and verse 10. Now, I don't want to just complain about the church, but this is a major crisis in the church right now, Unless, in case you didn't know, and I know you probably do. But when the lifestyles of professed believers does not adorn the, the gospel, we will have no moral capital or integrity in the world. The church today wants to have a place in the public debate, especially when it comes to moral issues. And yet the world can easily see and point to all of the public moral failures of Christians and of the church, often among its leaders. And on that basis, they can refuse to listen to anything we have to say. The church lacks integrity and moral power because it's not living a sanctified life. Now there's another part of God's purpose for the church that's often minimized, and I'm going to conclude with this. I just got done saying we've been sanctified to do something, to, to do good works. That's one of the reasons for our sanctification. But there's another part of God's purpose in our sanctification that I think is often minimized. We've been sanctified to say something to the world. Sanctification involves showing something to the world and saying something to the world. Peter says in 1 Peter 2.9, we are to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. You've been sanctified for that purpose. To declare the praises of God, the God who has saved us. God's people are to be speakers. We don't believe in quiet Christians and silent saints. We're to be speakers who tell the world about God and about what God has done to save us. I'm not saying that every Christian should be a pulpit preacher, but every believer is a witness who has a testimony in his or her heart to share with the world. Every believer ought to be able to talk about his or her faith intelligently to anyone willing to listen. Collectively, the church has been sanctified for the purpose of declaring God's message to the world. We should not expect the world to like what we have to say, but we have to say it anyway. We do not have the option of silence or compromise. It's our job to speak the truth of the gospel. It is not our job to produce results. This is God's purpose, and he's responsible for it, and he's also responsible for the care of his servants while they're in the world. 
I can tell you, and I think you would agree, that nothing is more exciting and satisfying than being a part of what God is doing and putting ourselves in the hands of God during the days of our sojourning. When the world rejects and persecutes us, we should not be surprised, but we should rejoice because then we know for sure that we belong to Jesus.